Namaste and in la catch and welcome to this episode of One World in a New World. I'm your host, Zen Benefiel, and this week we've got a very interesting guest from Dublin, Ireland. His name is Seamus Power. He is the founder of Powering Health. He is a health psychologist that's promoting improved awareness of benefits of a healthy lifestyle with an emphasis on mental fitness and connection to self. He is a certified health math practitioner or heart math practitioner. I have to make that distinction. Yeah. <laughs> and the interesting thing is that he also spent nearly 20 years working for Hewlett Packard and, and rose to the level of um, a uh, uh, constructor management uh, and, and just had a, a so to have the switch from being in a very demanding computer oriented digital oriented environment to now being with the heart math institute and, and uh, practicing what you do dramatic mm. shifts Seamus glad to have you here this is going to thank be you so much then. yeah that's a great introduction yeah it summarizes so much actually so so thanks for having me Oh, you're welcome. I am so entranced, I guess, by this whole process of learning how to acknowledge the inner side of life and making it practical in the outer. As we were talking before, I was very blessed with beginning early. And, uh, mm. you know, uh, for that, for us who began early, we didn't know whether it was a blessing or a curse because it yeah. was both <laughs> in that process. How did you first get in touch with the inner side of life in, in your being? Uh, I began late. <laughs> so At I least you began. Uh, yeah, at least I began. And again, it's very, very different from your own journey of having this awareness right very early in your childhood, I think, um, mm -hmm. of this somewhat this connection, this, there's something different, there's something here at a different um in a different realm or different domain that's going on you know right and um i i never had that honestly till about three or four years ago uh until i left the corporate world and my my childhood world was one of lacking self-confidence lacking self-esteem and lack was the was the common word for me for a good part of my life until i began to really examine um who i was what i stood for and um you know, it wasn't until I left the corporate world. I knew in the corporate world, do you know what? There's something not quite right here. There's something here. I've been disconnected from, you know, my true essence, my true self. But I never had could the that be because really... it's Could that be because it's time and money driven? Oh, I th that's a part of it for sure. Um, and, you know, because on the face of it, things are very good. You know what I mean? So you, you, you're, 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 you go into this life from a young child. You're influenced by the environment you're in. And I've... Um, the youngest of seven kids, seven children uh, wow. in my family, and there was a what very a lot of well, expectations. So. Uh, yeah, and there was, there was a very well prepared path for me to follow, and I blindly followed that path for a good period of my life. You know, so the education, the sports I played, the, the friends I had, you know, the whole environment was mm -hmm. very well laid out as regards the path I would play or path I would follow. So, so I, I, you know, blindly followed that path, really disconnected, going back to that sense of lack I had inside. I, you know, I didn't really have ambition. I didn't really have clarity around who I was within myself because, you know, I was very much focused. I'm through no fault of my own. That was just, you know, what, probably in our family. That we didn't know any better other at the time. We didn't right? know any better. I mean, this yeah. is life. This is how we lived. This is my existence. And, you know, I, I played that game. I went along with that game. And yes, yeah, like Victor Frankl speaks about in one of the, those lovely books, I can't remember the name of it, but Victor Frankl spoke about being safe in the herd. I think that's right. how a lot of people are, you know, that we're in the herd, we're safe, and we're invisible to a great oh, extent. Oh, we just came through a, a, you know, a couple of year process of being safe <laughs> in the herd, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. But ultimately, I think eventually, um, again, right through my career, like through my teens, through my 20s, through my 30s, I, I fell into that path of, you know, I go with the flow. Uh, no particular ambition, no particular plan, um, but there was still a sense of underneath, do you know what, there's something here that needs to be examined, but I never allowed myself to examine it because it's like you mentioned, we're living here 
in the lifestyle, in the money, the career, the job, the relationships, the family, the house, the mortgage, the practical. Where do you have time to much... examine self, right? <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it even reminds me in the corporate, like in, in, in my corporate work, like communication was the essence of everything we did in our work. But it was always very, very externally focused to our customers, right. to our teams, our management teams, our employees. So it was up and down, left and right, but never back into self. And that right. really struck me and landed very, very vividly with me. And when I left the corporate world, oh, what the hell? Yeah, do you know what? It's like you just you put your finger on it. But we're so busy out here, really, really focused on the external partners, the external, you know, tangible world outside ourselves that we, many, many people still know, and that's part of what I love doing now in my current work, is opening that door to actually what, what what's going on within ourselves, you know, so quietening the head, quietening the brain, quietening the external view and turning or reducing that filter and opening up the filter to actually really dig into what we are, who we are, what we stand for with, from within our hearts. And that's why I loved the heart math process and heart math was really a, an opener for me or a door opener to my heart because it allowed me to actually with those beautiful deeper than normal breaths just to stop right and come in and experience ah and it feels safe and when you allow yourself to go in there it was you know i got over that fear i i'd reached the threshold of do you know what? I'm ready now to actually begin to examine who I really am and what I stand for. And that for me was the beginning of a, a beautiful journey. You said it so um, simply and so elegantly mm -hmm. with the aspect of the breath, right? You just yeah. became mm -hmm. conscious of breathing, right? Yeah. We don't think about that normally. Yeah. However, you know, we do notice that when we're a little agitated, our breath increases. When we're mm -hmm. having a more pleasant experience, it slows down. And yet we can have that next choice of, okay, now I'm going to focus on purposely yeah. opening my breath. Mm. And that just, it, first of all, it releases what is oxytocin. Yeah. And it mm. gives you mm. kind of a brain high for a moment that allows you just that sense of well-being or at least a deeper yeah. sense of it. Mm. No, it's interesting. Yeah. In, in your transition between the corporate world and, and your self-search, if you will, it sounds like it was in the time frame by uh, when I had my awakening at 18, my parents sent me to a psychiatrist. And one of the things he said to me after the third visit and figuring out I really wasn't crazy <laughs> and he wanted to reflect to me that so that I would be a little more comfortable with him too. Mm. And he understood where I was at. He says, you know, you've had a spiritual awakening. Why so young? I don't know. Mm. Most people don't have it until their mid 40s if mm. they ever do yeah so this is that leaving the corporate world empty nesting with the family right and being having that okay now what question yeah. for, you know mm. the next phase of your life so mm. that's that self-exploration happens for many mm. there's oh, yeah. a few that have it younger like me and maybe we were just, you know, destined to be those guys that say, hey, look, you know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's something different. Um, so how did that reflect in, in in what I just said, in, in the congruence of your own experience and, and what you found as that deeper dive into your exploration into self? Yeah, it was a very gradual process, honestly. Um, it began about... 2007 2008 about like you know 15 years or so ago mm -hmm. um, where i was getting i was in the corporate world very successful on the face of it everything was good um but i was getting migraines and i was putting on weight so i was getting warning signs physical warning signs mm -hmm. oh okay so successful everything is good but my personal relationships weren't good but my professional you know on the face of it progression was very positive but it came to the point where I was working long hours and I was out of balance and my body began to tell me you're out of balance mm -hmm. so, yeah. and I wasn't feeling happy and that was the beginnings of um stepping into and like I mentioned earlier just taking a breath and stopping 
And that was the beginnings of pre heartbreak, pre pre anything. It was me just beginning to actually, in my own good time, do you know what? There's something in here I now really have to examine because the work I'm doing is there's something missing in it because I'm very successful, but I'm not happy. Sure, sure. And, and now you're curious as to why. Yeah, 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 exactly. And and that's what happened. So I read Bruce Lipton's book, The Biology of Belief. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent I book. I, I thank Bruce, Bruce Lipton for the shifts uh, in my direction, basically, because he switched on to me then, like challenging the dogma. It's what Bruce Lipton talked about in that book, one of the key themes. And I began to challenge the whole dogma of living out here and then beginning to actually, do you know what, examine what was going on in here in the heart. Mm -hmm. And I went back and then through that, I read a couple of other books, a couple of, you know, and I developed an interest with real clarity around learning about reading about psychology and how our, how our body operates, how our mind operates, how our beliefs operate. Mm -hmm. And I began then to read more and more and more of that. And I just, I was compelled to learn more and more and more. Resonated. Oh right. yeah, completely. Would you say, now, this was something, a um, guy not too far from you, Matthias Dema, who's, um, Mm. A professor at uh, in Belgium. Mm. Uh, I saw an interview with him and Tucker Carlson a few months ago, and and he mentioned that throughout it all, now Matthias was looking kind of like Howard Bloom did with Lucifer Principle. He was looking at exposing the global narrative of how people were being manipulated. Mm. What he said as a result in his own observation is that really what people seek is empathic resonance. Mm. Oh, and mm. that's that equates to me to loving mm. and being loved mm. right? that resonates there's an empathic yeah. resonance with that that's beyond anything you can imagine and it's mm. real it's visceral you know it when you sense it oh it's a compulsion like it really is it's a direction it's a steer that you just can't ignore right and, and i mean that's what i found it was the first time in my life really because when i was in my teens i had no clarity i wasn't really clear i had no ambition but this felt completely different and it was, and that led me on then to do an undergraduate degree in, in a humanities degree here at the University in Dublin, which led on to a master's in health psychology. So it started up, you know, a complete new kind of reawakening around what I felt and what I was experiencing, just like you described. And then I was eager to get an, an, an academic underpinning or grounding in this right, whole You wanted area. to check in, right? It's like, <laughs> exactly. you know, my master's degrees, I, I had already um you know i ran a seven million dollar a month product line for an aerospace mm. company and did mm. really well at it in my late 20s and mm. then, you know 10 years later i went back and got a, an mba because i figured okay it'd, it'd be good to know that i know what i know <laughs> yeah, and, yeah and with my metaphysical bent or my esoteric bent that most people kind of you know they pigeonhole me into here's a business degree uh, mm. how does that figure right yeah <laughs> <laughs> got to have it. You've got to yeah. understand the yeah. heart and the soft skills yeah. involved in getting people, places, and things to work mm. together well, mm -hmm. right? The, yeah, the hopefully the optimal. It, it's kind of like, uh, and I was reminded when you were talking about Bruce, uh, Spontaneous Evolution is another book that he wrote, uh, co-authored with a friend of mine, uh, Steve Behrman, uh, mm. who's known as Swami Beyond Ananda. And he, he's a kind of Jewish new age comedian that I've known for gosh, almost 30 years. Mm. And the, the two of them and how they craft that book is just much like biology and of uh, belief. It mm. takes people to a new level of not just experience, but curiosity and, yeah, yeah. and the permission mm. to be curious. Oh, exactly. Oh no, I'm into critical thinking because I would have I would have have accepted everything. Now, who am I to challenge like every book has been written before? There's so much knowledge out there. Who 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 would I be and how could I possibly challenge anything of the experts and what they've written? You know, and that was another kind of reinforcement of living out here and not trusting what was going on within. Um, but then mm -hmm. when you make that transition and you begin to appreciate your own value, you actually, you know, there it just changes how you show up for yourself and how you show up for others and encouraging others to to really allow themselves to be themselves you know which is becoming a more, a more powerful thing for me all the time you know and all that's right it's a great power. lead into live and let live right this is yeah what yeah our premise is to allow others to be who they are as long as they're peaceful mm. leave them alone they're not hurting mm. anybody and mm -hmm. then you know and then the 
the moral aspect, be a good human, and the legal aspect, don't be an aggressor. Mm. Well, we need to adjust our laws that keep others from infringing on our mm. Mm -hmm. freedoms, right? Which Absolutely. we ought to have. And that covers from individuals to governments. Well, that's going to take a while. Mm -hmm. and most folks, as you well know, coming out of a very time money oriented, mm. get it done as quick as you can and out the door expeditious, don't deal with any emotions, just mm. do the work, stay out of the yeah. way kind of mm. mentality, right? Mm. Oh, yeah. Exactly. And now we're going into this almost a free flowing, especially coming out of COVID with the redirection, the remote workforce change and, and all of those mm -hmm. kinds of things, it's precipitating yet another change in, as you were saying, how we show up. Yeah, exactly. And, exactly. And and we, you know, my mission really at this stage through my own journey, my own experience, I've been in the corporate world and it's just exactly on this topic is how do you open that door of opportunity up to people and particularly managers or leaders in that space where they've been living in a very externally focused space mm -hmm. to begin to open up the possibilities. Do you know what? There may be, maybe, maybe there is something in this connection to self that I can begin to explore as a leader that I begin to harness and use as a business tool. So for me, that's where the opportunity is for people who've been living in this external zone to be open-minded enough to begin to, do you know what? Let me go and explore this and actually see what a connection to heart can really do for me personally, right. but also for my business. You know what I mean? And right. that, I, that, that's where we are. That's the inflection point I think we're at, where more and more leaders and people who have been living out here, like myself, um, are ready to begin to explore and harness a source of energy, a source of power within themselves that allows them to be more successful and show up for themselves, but also allow others and their businesses to be successful. Because when you're connected here, that's my personal experience, around allowing yourself to be yourself, you just transmit at a different energy. And that's what I'd love more business leaders to do is to transmit from a different source of energy around how they are successful for themselves their families, their community, and their business, you know, I mean, and again, it's, you know, for you and I, it's probably as plain as the nose on our faces. There's so much sense in that, but I think it's allowing business. And, and how do we make sense common? That's what, that's our. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. So, so that's, that's the mission. I think for, you know, certainly, as you said, post COVID, I think a lot of people are more open to exploring areas of sources of energy that they might not have been open to exploring before you know sure when when you're obsessed on self hygiene and you're sequestered who are you going to talk to yeah, yeah <laughs> you know it's, and you don't even have to stand in front of the mirror to do it you're just by yourself and you're going to be exploring mm. why things are the way they are and yeah. how you've been living what you might do to change that how you want to mm. bring in this external experience of happiness even though mm. it comes from within it's yeah, yeah. Still evident in the outer world because that's how you experience it mm. Mm. Absolutely. transferring that it's like a salesperson right you transfer enthusiasm to your client mm. in order to get them to yeah buy your yeah. product or service or whatever mm. it's the same thing only that in that enthusiasm is embedded in the depths of our being and as you mm. have found now in the process of finding that, there was another gentleman, one of my first interviews with uh, Anthony Upward, that very similar, had been in the business world, figure out, okay, there's something missing there. There's a lack of community. Well, how do we create mm. community and the synergy mm. of bringing people together toward a vision and mission, mm. right? Instead mm. of the prescriptive, like you were talking about the leadership, I think it seems anyway, that leaders tend to be uh, and uh, codependent i'll just put it in that frame mm -hmm. they're more concerned about how everything is going to appear mm. and, yeah, and yeah. want to control that yeah. mm. and so they've got the systems in place to do that so is there, mm. there's this hierarchy that strikes fear in the lower levels yeah. Right? Mm. Instead of empowering those low, lower levels to actually feed up how things mm. are really working, what the improvements could be, exactly. you know, the, the changes that are necessary, because that's yeah. where it's all experienceable.
Oh, exactly. I mean, so it's, it re that really reminds me of my own time in the in middle management in Hewlett Packard because it, 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 I, I, when I got my first management role, I was kind of really conflicted about where my um, role of allegiance is. is. Is my allegiance primarily up the up the up the line, or is it back down to the people who know? What they're doing, who, who are engaging with the customers, who have the great ideas, who have the great energy, or are on the front lines on the cold face every day. Right. But you have this kind of command and con control structure, just like you've described there, coming from the top down. And you know, the middle management are right in the middle, trying to manage, you know, and be the buffer zone between the energy from you know the employees who really know what they're doing, they're engaging with the customers, they're doing the work. And then you have you know the the command and control, the fear, maybe the control coming down and you know you're, you're trying to manage that in the middle sure. and, for, and for me the more you can begin to you know collapse um, and allow that energy to flow from the bottom to allow the managers to be open to and engage with um, you know that that core energy like it's a, it's a it's a it's a metaphor for the body and the, allowing the energy to come from within yes. allow the energy to come from your your people and trust them and it's back to the word trust and to engage because, you know, one of the words in, in Hewlett Packard brings back as well vividly to me is employee engagement, you know, and for me, the, 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 the leaders who are most engaged are the with the employees are the leaders who are most engaged with themselves. And it's another good reason for me to really encourage leaders who are examining, you know, how they drive and develop their business going forward from a new sense of energy is to begin to open that door to allowing themselves to explore themselves first as a door opener to engaging better with everyone around them, including their employees, you know? Mm -hmm. Now, I did valid in my experience as well in the aerospace industry. I, I was kind of at that lower level, right? I was dealing with everybody in the plant. I, I could go anywhere and, and to get whatever I needed done, especially if there was an aircraft on the ground that needed a, a spare part and mm. everything just dropped and that's all you focused on and everybody knew that that was the you know, the turnaround. Um, what I found, uh, uh, you know, I brought my Midwestern value system and treating everybody <laughs> how I'd like to be treated. And I rose to the top of the production uh, on time delivery, you know, schedules and all of that. And uh, I can't remember exactly what the chart was called. I do remember that there were 35 people in the department. And I eventually got to a place where I suggested interpersonal skills classes in a departmental meeting because our management had said, what can we do for you to improve? Mm. And I'd yeah. watched all of this and I'd even talked to a couple of super supervisors about what I was doing that was different than everybody else. Mm. I was out of the command and control yeah. scenario. Yeah. I was just, let's deal with people and, and encourage and empower and, and mm. help them out wherever I could. You know, mm. what, I, what can I do for you while I'm off in the plant doing what I do and, you know, pick up extra stuff that I can bring back to you and, and mm. give you more time to do the focus work on the job that you're supposed to be doing, right? Mm -hmm. So when I brought that up in, and, and this is how inducted the lower ranks were i was shunned by mm. everyone in the department for almost two weeks nobody would mm. talk to me because i mm. brought that up and i simply in how i brought it up i said you know we've all come through the expedited ranks we know how to work around the system now we're in the system at a little deeper level dealing mm. with professional degreed people in most cases mm. and they expect a different level of behavior from us mm. so we need to step up and that's all in interpersonal skills mm. Mm. and i was doing it not to besmirch people in a department however when people hear something like that the first thing they do is what self-deprecate second mm. thing they do is project on others mm -hmm. because they don't have that awareness yet yeah, yeah, yeah. And the power within us all, you know what I mean? And it's such a, a massive, massive, important, yeah. and even more so now in this modern world, you know, around to have that ability to not live out here, but to really, really harness and, and trust what's inside. Because I think they're so, we're so conditioned to actually please others and to follow the command to control structure 
we kind of forget about the power you've just described. Well, and even in our leadership, you know, we trust people in politics and in legislation because we put them there. And a lot of times it's like, we don't want to have to deal with it. So we want to put our trust in others and, and then have somebody to blame when stuff doesn't work out right. Well, instead of now, I believe that this shift that's taking place is that people are becoming more empowered. And this is what we desire from the Live and Let Live movement is to empower people to begin to rise up and build the numbers and then find those low percentage people that, and I don't mean low percentage as a, in a lower rank, there's very few people that want to step up and deal with the intricacies and in laws and legislation, let alone the people and the structure and, and how we uh, believe that system to be, which most of it, it, I believe if you ask anyone that they would tell you that our political systems are corrupt. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, it, 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 well, how do we change that? Yeah. You I'm can't sorry, I've done, I've that. You got to get involved, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, and and that's it. And it's it's uh, sorry, I've got a dog, a mad dog in the background here. Hope this wasn't too important. Oh, that's to fine. Here is like, no. animals um, are people too, right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But but it, that's it's the essence. It it is it, harnessing a power that we've forgotten we have. You know, as as people, as as and all the roles we play as leaders and the insecurities that come with that. I mean, so that, that for me is getting beneath the, the, the superficial, the facade that we operate at mm -hmm. and allowing people to be people, which is what I love about living that live, because you're coming at it from the human personal level and trying to get underneath the, the roles and the facade and the games and the politics and really coming up and showing up as the true beautiful humans we all are, you know? Yes. And, and we are truly beautiful humans when we allow ourselves to be and remove the distractions of the world that how we think we need to be. And that's the operational capacity that we have from the shoulders up. You know, we, we've got a whole body that's an instrument that we don't know how to tune, let alone use or play in concert yet. So this is what we're looking at is how do we learn to work together better collectively because we need to, it's almost a, a must for us to be sustainable as a planet, right? We, the, uh, I loved what we were talking about Sharma in one of our earlier conversations in the program that he had at MIT called Transforming Business Society and Self. This is where that is coming in and his theory U model is a, a, one of the ways that, that he found to present it in a model that's experiential not just a thought experiment. I mean, that, that, that model like is beautiful model because I, I build that model actually into my business now, that you model. Mm -hmm. And it begins with like the heart map and slowing. And, and the part of that Otto's model, the Otto Sharma's model is observe, observe, observe. And you know, presence. Yeah, exactly. Like awareness and checking right. in and challenging and being a critical thinker, you know. So it's a beautiful, beautiful process that goes so beautifully into, you know, the heart math stuff. Uh, I also integrate some work from Susan David, who's a beautiful psychologist in Harvard as well, around the emotional agility. And those tools really yes. play beautifully into the, into the U model because it's slowing awareness, checking in and, and letting go. And mm -hmm. it, it just, I mean, that's why I have such a, an affinity with, with live and let live and all the work you're doing as well there, because it's 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 a human human allowing humans to be human basically and to forget and to to find balance because we can't live in here all the time in the heart or we can't live out here all the time it's it's a bigger picture than that look we discussed this i think the last time we spoke right, there's well. a synergy that takes place between yeah. the inner and outer you know the, yeah yeah um, the the fact that we live half inside and half outside yeah it's the time we're bereft of that inner so we're that's where the emotions and and that kind those kinds of qualities that we have in life that have a whole uh, spectrum uh, of capacity to for recognition first of all and transcendence second of all by doing so and so how do you notice in in this process of first of all acknowledging the emotions and and dealing with the outliers right that 
that cause us to lock up or resist or fear change? For me, I think it's the connection to heart. It, it's slowing and observing. I mean, I mean, so that book, Joseph Jarowski was a big influence for me as well. And he worked with, with Sharma and, mm -hmm. and developing the U theory. And, and for me, it was about um, David Bohm, as we discussed him the last time as well, right. was allowing yourself to think with your whole body, not just think with your head. And that for me is a skill that's so important. It underpins everything I'm doing in my own work. And I think, you know, it really resonates with what you're doing in your work and with Live and Let Live as well, is allowing that connection to develop and to feel, as back to the word experience, so we're so conditioned on the superficial world of living out of the head and decisions and goals and activities and all sorts of command and control type um, Push activities. Push and pull energy to get what you yeah, want. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. And when we allow ourselves to really connect with all the other channels that are available to us, that for me is the difference between, you know, living in a, a superficial type world, externally focused world, and a world where we're fully aware and uh, mm -hmm. more engaged and connected with. Speaking of stories. more fully aware mm -hmm. and engaged, <laughs> let, let's talk about the how, right? Because we can yeah. talk about this philosophy and it's a wonderful philosophy. We're both mm. in agreement on that. How mm. do we bring it into the body? What is the experience? What are the protocols? What are the notions, the sensations, mm. the the allowance of or recognition of the observations uh you know it, it, in this process are there areas of, of your body kind of like the three brain philosophy of the indigenous right where mm. there's the first brain second brain first brains have mm. got solar plexus intuition second brains the heart mm. third brain is actually the head and so you yeah. process in that upward motion rather than downward which is what mm. calls, causes the dis-ease in people because they're yeah. pushing all this crap down their body and yeah. they wonder why they're sick, right? Mm. So how does that experience evolve for you? Do you have particular places in your body that you tune into in these mm. kinds of situations that have allowed you to observe to a greater yeah that's 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 a brilliant question because um that's an experiential question for me that is the source of why i'm feeling i'm on a beautiful journey of improved connection all the time and mm -hmm. it's an ongoing journey but for me the first brain is the brain of the heart the heart brain and i think it's the first you know brain that's evolved after our conception as well, you know, it, that the brain is the, one of the first things to develop, or excuse me, the heart is one of the first things to develop as part of our whole embryonic process. Right. So, so for me, well, what feeds um, that? I, I would just like to offer, <laughs> and, and I, I've taught that this is not an argument with where you're at because yeah. I truly appreciate that yeah. perspective. Mm. Where's the umbilical cord attached? Yeah. To here. Okay. And you're down in your, in your, yeah, your navel. Yeah. Right. So mm. would that not be the first signs of life? It could be. I, I'm open to that. I, that just came to me <laughs> as you were talking about that because I was thinking, okay, now how could that be relevant and, and how might the natural structure appear mm. so that mm. we can see it clearer and, and, and move into that? And so that prompted yeah, yeah. a question, right? And, and, oh, brilliant uh, question. Yeah. So back to the heart. <laughs> and for me it begins with the heart I, and maybe there's another beginning underneath that who knows but where i am right now um and my own journey has been very much around heart math and for me breath is the door opener to heart mm -hmm. um for me breath is the place where i'm able to actually slow down the head and literally open up a conversation with my heart and open up and really feel What's it's a conscious process. Heart. You're thinking oh, about yeah. the process. I'm breathing and allowing and noticing. Going back to Susan David, mm -hmm. um, the first thing Susan David talks about is I'm not angry. I'm not sad. I'm noticing that I'm angry. I'm noticing that right. I'm sad. I'm noticing this. I'm noticing that. So now that's every... an essential step to be able to step back in your observation. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. It's the starting point. And then with that, so, so you're noticing, you're noticing and more tuned into what's going on, not just here in your head, but in your body and noticing attention. I'm noticing, you know, there's some, this tightness in my chest, the tightness in my stomach, my gut, maybe going back down to the navel. I'm noticing that there's something going on down here. 
And with that noticing, I stop. I take a deep breath. And I might want to like two or three just normal, deeper than normal breaths. Mm -hmm. And then I allow myself to connect. I allow myself to process. Now, is know. that where the curiosity comes in? It is the, okay, now I've, I've observed this sense or sensation, mm. right? Yeah. Mm. It's uncomfortable or it's different or I'm just noticing the sensation, right? Yeah. Without any qualifications as to what it yeah. is. Exactly. Then how do you, how does that process then flow into the interpretation and practical use? Yeah. So then one, once I'm slowing and processing and allowing that information to be processed, I'm not ignoring it. I'm not suppressing it. I'm actually, my word of 2023 is engage. So. All right, John Luke. <laughs> engage yeah right. so so for me that that is the part of, of a process I, that has been evolving for me and now because i've built that u theory process around all the tools i'm integrating into how i serve myself mm -hmm. that's how i can be so clear now and i really appreciate you asking these questions because it allows me to actually step in in a very you know coherent way that's another key word around um around heart map is noticing, stopping, breathing, mm -hmm. engaging, and then making sense of. Oh yeah, so that's what that feeling is. And being able to engage the discomfort, wherever it is, in the shoulders, in the navel, in the head, I'm feeling something. And then within, you know, it doesn't, doesn't take a long time. It's, it's almost within seconds, you know, that you're actually able to a very short period of time to be able to actually stop notice engage and move on mm -hmm. that means a lot of the clients i'm working with right now are in that space where they become overwhelmed or overcome with you know this sense of panic the sense of business and they don't take that time to actually stop and notice and think it just accumulates and accumulates and accumulates and that's where that feeling of overwhelm comes from because for me it's about intervening you know, everything in Powering Health that I've done is about don't wait for something to happen. Get underneath it, intervene and engage with it, understand it. So that's why those tools like HeartMath and Susan David's Emotional Agility Model just blend so beautifully. And Positive Intelligence is another tool of the three tools built around that new framework. Sure. Of, of, and, of, and of, and now it's, that, it's powerful, you know. Absolutely. And, and uh, tremendously powerful. Now, when we look at life and, and this, um, what we generally tend to call chaos, right? Mm. And you were talking about coherence. Well, the universe is coherent, mm. right? We see chaos in our lives and things like that. We, and we don't necessarily realize, and I think this is part of what heart math uh, brings out, is that there's patterns in everything. Mm -hmm. And these patterns uh, promote this lack of understanding. Let me back up. The patterns don't promote it. Our misunderstanding of not uh, from not seeing the patterns mm. is what keeps us. We think that these things are all coincidental or happenstance or, or chaotic um, mm. when actually they're kind of like de Hock in, in his chaotic organization, right? The, you've got the skill sets to step up and fit in wherever it is that those skill sets fit and to find your mm. own coherence in mm. the world as a result. Now, these are things, do you feel that people kind of miss that they try to put themselves in that codependent place of what they should do or how their families have done or what their pressure is towards? rather than saying, hey, wait a minute, I've got my own path to follow here. Please help me to do so. Mm. I, I think that's what happens because we, a lot of people are so conditioned into operating from what other people think rather than actually trusting. And I, I mean, I'm, I'm that soldier. I was there for years. Mm -hmm. we're so well, we all have been. Think. It, it's, and it's okay, right? It's yeah, yeah. the process, right? This is part of it. There's no exactly. good or bad. It's how we think it to be. But it's it's back to Lipton. It's about the environment we're in. We can't help but you know act out of you know the environment, nature versus nurture. We're born with a certain set of attributes as as humans. This is the way we are. Mm -hmm. um, 
this is the way our species shows up. This is how we're built in this. Right. And then we start cutting those so off as we grow older and yeah. try to fit in yeah. to society rather than just be a part of it. Yeah, we're born connected, perfectly yeah. connected to the world. And we somehow lose that sense of our, our, you know, the pure natural connection of the chaos that we are when we're born. We're, we're just so immersed in in that and we lose that connection i think that's part of the problem is that we become conditioned by the expectations and the showing up and the thoughts and the words of other people i mean that's my own influence in our environment sure that, you know it, we're, we we carry a burden with us based on the actions and the deeds and the words of other people often you know and Could then we, we spend a long it? time trying to process that and it, it takes sometimes a lifetime to process it mm. um if we ever do right Mm, now, mm. you mentioned that the, this problem and, and again nothing's good or bad and how we perceive it to be is this possibly just a, a result of the evolution of a planetary civilization through its various phases you know i see where we're at right now is kind of globally we're adolescents at best mm. Mm, mm right and we all know that you know adolescents or they think they know everything and want to push their way or, you know it's very mm. self-centered and self or self-righteous kind of behavior mm. right mm. so we've reached a point now where we've got this global connect we've got um more time and space to have thought experience or thought experiments mm. let alone the engagement of them is this possibly more where we're at and that we can see this nurturing that's taken place that now this coherence is being able to come to the surface because there's more inquiry about it and, and this is maybe kind of where the mm. collective um, energy or, or the wave of what critical mass maybe mm. affecting the thoughtmosphere yeah. that's bringing it up for others to explore and, and engage as well yeah, i mean so there's, there's so much we don't know i mean to say like i said we're adolescents or probably even younger we're infants probably you, you know what i mean as regards our understanding so right for me there's just so much we don't know and you know i wrote an article recently or early like last year sometime for linkedin challenging the whole come back to lift and challenging the dogma right of, right like, right that's one of the articles you shared with me you yeah. know what i mean so and, it, and it's like that it's about you know allowing ourselves to go beyond the kind of self-inflicted boundaries we've imposed through science now i love science science has been a, a great well, service to us but, but know, sometimes you know it, it, it helps explain the magic right <laughs> exactly yeah How, exactly because science is, is great to measure but we can only measure what we can measure but science may be a limitation in how it, it, it limits our ability to go beyond what we can measure and i think that's where we are in our world right now is is there's so much that we don't understand and you know the, the, it, it's I, i'm conflicted by this myself because i love science and the ability to be able to actually measure but it, in my view, there is maybe an opportunity to step beyond what we can measure if we're truly going to be able to understand what's well, beyond that's where the, the intuition measure, you know? comes in, right? That that mm. sense of, of you have a certain logic train and and there may be no tracks <laughs> right yeah. in front of you. And yet as you travel down it, the the um railroad ties and, and rails begin to appear because you've done the yeah. previous work that allowed them to do so yeah i wonder if the same thing happens because of, of where we've been and now this natural evolutionary process is taking place where there's this emergence of mm. the natural order that's also uh, here's the perspective that i'm looking at the Vedantic philosophy, right? That's been around for let's say fifteen thousand years is an mm. approximation of when those the Rig Vedas and the Vedas were written, right? Mm. And they speak to the unity consciousness and the threads of such that are that each of us are. Well, that mm. create if we're a thread, then that would lead to creating a tapestry, right? And and how do we want to make that tapestry? How can mm. we learn to engage the others right next to us in order to find that place for us and that in this coherence 
quest, you know, we're finding that science is reflecting, like we were talking about the three brains earlier, right? Mm. There's neurosensors in the gut, there's neurosensors in the heart, and they yeah. feed the head mm. because yeah. from that. Now, there's also this notion that many is like, okay, why, why am I here? What's my mm -hmm. mission? What, what am I here for? You know, what, what, what's this reality like and how do I play in it well? Mm -hmm. This would tend to, or would it tend to lead to an understanding of, of a potential perfected form, fit and function in the world as a result that that coherence then shows up as? Good question. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know that journey. It, yeah. it seems journey to be logical on, and it does yeah. kind of make sense. So how do we determine what that might be? What tools do we have to investigate? What tools do we need mm -hmm. in order to investigate it further? And then how can we work to together to create them? Mm -hmm. Or are they already built in as the psycho-spiritual nature of our being rather than an exterior yeah, and that's what I was getting at in that art. That's what I was getting at actually in that article is to, you know, we have the scientific tools, the measurements, what we can measure scientifically. But I think, I firmly believe we have this inbuilt advanced measurement system if we allow ourselves to be able to actually re engage with it and mm -hmm. to trust it. Now, and again, that's where a lot of the science and the scientists would say, well, if you can't measure it, it's too intangible to be able to actually build a theory or build something tangible out of this feeling of something that we have inside us that we can't really put our finger on or measure and it's almost like a leap of faith well, well that's you know what, what this is what they, really exactly science. what they did with the uh higgs boson mm. right the god particle mm. um there was the from the examination the numbers or, or you know the technology that was used showed a decay mm. of something this is how they interpret it and of course you know how we interpret things is how we look at them first mm. and, and our interpretation evolves from there if we're not open enough to consider other options yeah. what i felt when i first heard of this was you know you're ramming a couple of protons together at near light speed and you're going to create an explosion at a subatomic level that's going to rip the fabric whatever fabric there is right mm. we're looking at dimensional things or well, there's got to be layers or fabric in between right so you're going to be ripping that and i queried one of lawrence krauss's um tas at a science meeting here locally several years ago i said is it possible that there was just a rip in the fabric that was repairing and that's what they saw as the decay mm. and assumed that there was a particle of course i got the deer in the headlights look back <laughs> right because that nobody ever asked that question yeah 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 i don't know the, yeah, it's I just think like that's a perfect question to ask Oh no, but they, they think that's the territory we're in. Like it's that there's nothing that's off the table. Like every and because that's how science works. You develop the theory and then of the, the best insights you can from all the best minds in the world, and then you go and you know falsify. It. And that was kind of what I taught, you know, built into that article as well. Is you come up with your best theory with all of the information you've got at the time with from whatever source you can grab it with the scientific instrument or your internal body instrument whatever i'm sure that question came from you from your own internal sense your own sense of who you are your experience your connection and then being able to you know that's what i think we need to to embrace and welcome more and more of that of the mm -hmm. questions open inquiry allow, yeah exactly that will allow yeah. people just to really be open exactly like you know like i wasn't open to hear in my own like um simple body experience or my own human experience of living here but when you open that door there's great power when you allow more and more people to walk through that door to you know really connect with what we're talking about here you know kind of like a zen door hmm. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> um that's actually the full name um in this process and how we are learning to engage each other is there something that you have found that you 
is like a golden nugget that you share with others whenever you can or they're open? I'm not sure if it's golden or not, but it's basic and it's back to what we've already practiced and what I've been practicing right through our conversation today. It's the breath mm -hmm. and slow and connect and feel. That that that's my golden nugget for it's a starting point for my clients, everyone I work with. It's just stop. Well, and so yeah, if I could offer something, uh, may I offer something? This oh, is, this is something I, I learned as a teenager when I was in a really kind of um, uh, like a Tesla ball kind of, right? <laughs> it's just nervous and full of anxiety. And I found myself putting my fingertips together. Try this. Put your mm. fingertips together. And using the breath that you were doing earlier, feel your heartbeat in your fingertips. Mm. Yeah. Now that's the what I added to the breath in my mm. coaching is that this allows us to get out of our head. Mm. Right? You're feeling your heartbeat. What are the two most important things for mm. your existence to continue? Mm your heartbeat and your breath. Mm. This is how that heart math kind of Beautiful. comes in the coherence oh, yeah. that oh, yeah. this operation creates. And mm. you can do it in any moment, any stress-filled situation. You know, it, it's just, it's a great tool. Oh. And it may not work for everybody. It, it just depends on your level of sensitivity. Some people can feel it instantly, mm. you know, just because they've never done it before. And it's like, oh, wow, you know. Mm. And the effect that it has oh, it's it is mm. profound. Like your mm. breath, it, it's it. like yeah. another layer of that that you can dive deeper with. Mm. And I found it to be a great tool for sitting and contemplating with a question mm. and just allowing mm. those thoughts to come up and watch them. Mm. And then find, you know, um, and if, do you find that when you're in that place, you have three voices not just one you've got the two that are bickering <laughs> right and then there's a third that provides pearls of wisdom every once in a while that are completely different than your own stream of mm. consciousness Do you, have and you experienced that there's times um that there's a little voice in the back of my head mm -hmm. that's uh whirring around and it's when i'm brushing my teeth or having a shower that these insights that come up and that voice that's whirring around all the time yeah. where, you know, oh, that kind of, oh, well, moments come up with moments of clarity that come up when you least expect. Oh, sure. When you, that's, that's their nature, right? Yeah. It's like as long as you expect them, they're never going to come. Oh, no, no, exactly. You can anticipate, yeah. which is different. Mm. Mm. That's but, the but whole... That's true. Yeah, but, but when you say that, that those, those voices, like, it's like back to Susan David again about awareness and mm -hmm. being you know tuned into and when they when those um thoughts of you know why did they do that or you're harshing yourself or you're beating yourself up over something I, i'm very quick to notice those at this stage and engage with them and get beneath them um and when you're slowing using that heart math practice it creates a great space for those other thoughts that are going that are going on in the back of your mind to create a space for those to to be noticed as well mm -hmm. uh, i think that that's the best way i can describe what what you're sharing there around for me in my own personal experience is the power of breath to get underneath to kind of come back to heart and find that balance but it also opens up that other voice that's here that's sure. tumbling away that you you don't necessarily and you always tuned into but that when you're down in that space of being more connected and using the breath it creates that space for, you know, and um, sure that Shemin talked about this, about innovation and creativity mm -hmm. comes from that space of when you're slowing and connected and using all your channels, creativity is more likely to arise than when you're busy up here. You know what I mean? And this, sure. it's a no brainer for me, you know? Right. Speaking of brain, um, one of the things that 
Right, we've got this dual brain going on, left hemisphere, right hemisphere, analytic, mm -hmm. um, creative, and yet there's no discussion about the corpus callosum. Mm. Right? And the corpus callosum is the membrane that allows the two to talk to each other. Mm. It, it's the transceiver, if you will. Yeah, yeah. Well, in, in looking at it further, and it, it's interesting because, you know, we're <clears throat> there's many systems in the body. Right from the chakras, the datuns, the marmas, uh, the, there's multiple layers that we can examine in various cultural traditions and uh, spiritual lineages. It's interesting that in so doing and looking at the brain structure, the hypothalamus is at the bottom of the corpus callosum and the pineal is at the top. Mm. And those two are associated with the third eye and the throat chakra. Mm. I believe. So it's interesting how those, you know, that integration perhaps may bring that centeredness and in, in, in an operational capacity. Because we're looking at the science and trying to explain the experience, mm. right? Mm. That's what I have always done. And I've had some pretty freaking bizarre experiences. Well, I know there's got to be some science somewhere to explain them because mm -hmm. there's all, everything is explainable. All the mysteries we can know when we ask our right questions that lead us to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. but this this comes back to the question of science that must measure it as well, because M, like MRIs show up and, and show where the brain lights up when you're having various experiences and thoughts mm -hmm. and emotions and so on and so forth. So, but, but really, does it give it any insight on, you know, the whole process of how and um, how consciousness works because it's, it, it, it gives us, you know, I, I think maybe a, a superficial view even though science is amazing and we know a lot more than we ever did and we have brilliant instruments, but really, really, we're still scratching at the surface. Sure. Really understanding, you know, what, how this thing here works and how it operates. Right. You know, and we can see where the activity is, but really, really, are we getting down into the nuts and bolts of understanding, really? It's like, you know, the understanding of the cosmos. And the creating cosmos, things that allow us to experience. Yeah. One of the uh, old friend, Dan Winter, um, haven't seen him in years. Uh, interesting fellow. Came out of IBM. You came out of Hewlett Packard. So he came out of IBM and worked with HeartMath for a while and developed this coherence biofeedback software. Oh, yeah. mm. And so there were, <clears throat> excuse me, I think at least five different levels of the heart coherence that one can experience. Mm. Get those processes like with the breathing and the fingertips and, and getting yourself to where you're in a, a I think he calls it a state of bliss, mm. right? Where that the, your heart harmonics are all in relation to, interestingly enough, the golden mean. Mm. So mm. it brings in that science aspect of it. I mean, it's, and it's actually, the golden mean like, has I mean, a lot to do with I, it. Absolutely. And I mean, heart rate variability, the whole science behind our heart math um, and heart focused breathing is breath as the master, as the master regulator of our physiology, but mm -hmm. it's really around the heart rate variability and how the amplitude of our variation in our heartbeat goes from second to second. And the more connected and the more regulated we are within our body, the smoother that, that heart rate variability is. And when we're overwhelmed, it's very jagged and, and all over the all over the place. Right. So that's it allows us to actually get hit, you know, when we're connected and coherent. What is the the amplitude of the wave is reduced? Mm. Right. You don't have this uh yeah, yeah. vacillation. These high spikes. Exactly. Yeah. It's yeah. going to be more uniform. I think that's nature, called so. amplitude, right? No, it's the amplitude is the height of the wave, exactly. So yeah, you, that's what I'm saying. The amplitude yeah. reduces yeah. Yeah. Uh, when you're, you're more in uniform. the coherence place. Exactly. And yeah. you're more uniform as well. So to become more, more regular in its frequency and more regular in its amplitude as well. So you won't have the spikes of overwhelm, of going very up and down and very right. dramatically, but it's going to become... Yeah, DSM calls that manic depression. <laughs> that the spiked one i hope not i hope not the um the the, the level one because you're in a state of no I, in without the advantages uh, of the heart math or the practices right mm. the manic depression the mania is at the high out 
amplitude. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah. depression is at the lower amplitude. Oh, yeah, yeah. Vastly yeah. back and forth in between those mm. two because you don't know how to manage it. And mm -hmm. instead of learning how to manage it, we give them Thorazine or Depakote or yeah. whatever, right? Some yeah. other or cocktail that's mm. supposed to work. And, and they obviously, yeah, they may work for some. I had a dear mm. friend that was a um, computer programmer. He worked for a company that did um, high level encrypted database um, programming for the NSA. Mm, yeah. And he was phenomenal. He's bipolar as well. And it, mm. when he was younger, it, 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 he didn't notice it as much as when he got older. And uh, eventually got to a place where he just couldn't handle it anymore. And he ended up at 40, committed suicide. Yeah, yeah. And it just, you know, broke my heart when he did because he was really a nice, gentle mm. man mm. and was just so confused about the outer world and his yeah. place in it that he didn't know what to do. And that for me is, uh, when I was studying my master's in health psychology, they, they, they were strong, strong advocates for an integrated approach to healthcare. You mm -hmm. know, so to take, and it's really a custom approach. So every person, treating every person as an individual, not just give the drug across the board or not just, you know, do the other treatments, but every person is assessed on the merits of where their own journey, their own experience and really getting down to root cause. I mean, so that's something maybe that's missing in the modern mainstream Western approach to healthcare is everyone's Absolutely. treated with, you know, but, and, and you're not allowing for, you know, and maybe that's part of the health system issue is the time to really enable and get underneath what's going on in everyone's own individual <clears throat> illness and journey, you know. I just had a conversation with a doctor that lives in Florida. She's from Peru. And mm -hmm. we were talking about the art of medicine. She's been in the field about 20 years. And we mm -hmm. were talking about how the science is one level and then the mm -hmm. gut is another. Mm -hmm. the, the sense and feeling that she gets from yeah. working with the patients and that how we, that the medical industry has not allowed the art to be fully practiced and the constraints mm. that have been put on it through the insurance structures right yeah. they're, they're where treatment is limited and their their time with the patients and and the relationships built and things like that just aren't as available as what they were at earlier on when their our population was less perhaps yeah. And now there's this disconnect that, and burnout, she said, oh, what, 65% of um, physicians uh, suffer burnout. Mm -hmm. And so these are the kinds of things, the reasons why, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're pushed. Now, speaking of pushing, not that we, not that I'm asking you to push something, <laughs> right? Um, as an offering, and then, because we're, we're kind of nearing time to close up, what mm -hmm. do you think is a, a great, simple, individual practice or, or a piece of advice that you can give to our audience? Yeah, I'm sorry to beat this up again, um, but I'm going to, I think the only, people will think the only thing I do is, is encourage people to breathe and slow. But for me, it's take time to slow, to notice what's going on within you because we live so much of our time outside, just take, sit down for a minute every morning before you get up, maybe sit on the side of your bed and just take one minute. Just and breathe and connect and stop. Just like we're doing now for a minute mm. <laughs> or less than. And for me, it's so powerful. Yeah. And well, normally that would be dead air, right? <laughs> Back in the old production days, when yeah. when you had to have the the conversation just keep on going, otherwise they called it. If there yeah. was a gap, it was called dead air, and you don't mm. have that. Well, now yeah. we just created the opportunity for that pause. Yeah, and I'm thinking during the day when you notice and get better at noticing that sense of discomfort, overwhelm, whatever, when you're more tuned into your body, gift yourself that during the day as well. 
and find the balance that's working for you. So you'll find, you know, when you create that space to notice and create that time to stop, you're going to notice a difference and other people will notice a difference in how you're engaging with them as well, because it's a, it's a true is a ripple effect. When you're engaging better in here, it changes everything outside as well. And the last thing I'll mention actually is a book, lovely little book I read uh, by a guy called Hey Nim Sunim. He wrote a book called Things You Notice Only When You Slow Down. And he it was a beautiful little book, but he talked, he, he spoke about um, one of the verses in there is about when I'm happy, the world is happy. When I'm angry, the world is angry. So basically, we create our own reality from how we're engaging in here. When we create happiness Bingo. within ourselves, we're creating happiness out there too, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's that simple. And if you're not, if you, if you wonder how you are, right, if you truly can't determine what's going on inside of you, look at what's happening right in front of you. Mm. And that'll give you a great reflection of what's going on inside. Yeah. Yeah. Super. Seamus, this has been just a wonderful conversation and one of many I'm sure we're going to have over the years. And, and uh, I look forward to further engagement and what we can do together, uh, collectively, and, and even with uh, Live and Let Live. But yeah, I'm looking, so looking forward to it. Oh, it's been fantastic. Thanks so much for just a, but yeah you've really made me think uh, as well through this conversation about you know that's why i call them apocalyptic chats yeah it's it's fantastic so i really really enjoyed it and thanks for having me on and really looking forward to everything to do with living to live as well so thanks again you're welcome and namaste <clears throat> and in Thank you. catch thanks for sticking with us for this episode of one world in a new world i'm zen benefiel your host and i'll see you next time